All right, so I am now going to speak about what I was scheduled to speak about, which was Epstein's anomaly in pulmonary valve stenosis. Um, and I still don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this lecture. Um, we're going to talk about the same things, just different lesions. So starting with Epstein's anomaly, Epstein's anomaly is an abnormality of the tricuspid valve. It's relatively rare, about less than 1% of congenital anomalies. Most commonly, it's sporadic, and the sexes are equally affected. And um, this is kind of a diagram of what Epstein's anomaly should look like according to a basic textbook. It is actually probably wrong. Um, Epstein's anomaly predominantly affects the septal leaflet and the posterior leaflet, which is not really depicted here, of the tricuspid valve. The anterior leaflet actually usually is attached right at the annulus, and it's just really, really, really long. The other two leaflets are little nubbins down here near the apex of the heart, and the, this big, long, sail-like anterior leaflet makes up for the defective length of those other two leaflets, and so you have a zone of coaptation, which is the point where the leaflets come together to prevent regurgitation. It's way down here towards the apex of the heart, and I say kind of tongue-in-cheek that this is where they're supposed to come together to prevent regurgitation because with Epstein's anomaly, they almost always have some uh, regurgitation. So obviously, it's not doing such a hot job of um, trying to make up for the def deficit. ECG, they will get these what are called classic Himalayan P waves, which means really, really big P waves. And that's the result of the fact that the right atrium is enormous. Probably the biggest right atriums you'll ever see in Epstein's anomaly. And that's because not only of tricuspid regurgitation, but because part of the ventricular myocardium is functionally a part of the atrium. Chest x-rays, they will have very, very large cardiac silhouettes, and it's all right atrium. The right ventricle is frequently very small. Associated abnormalities, um, there's an interatrial communication, most commonly a threatened foramen ovale. Um, this is relevant because people who have severe tricuspid valve regurgitation have increased right atrial pressures, and in the presence of an atrial septal defect, that can lead to right to left shunting and cyanosis. 20% of them will have ventricular pre-excitation. That's also called WPW. Um, and um, it, that can lead to both problems with reentrant arrhythmias as well as potentially life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias in the setting of atrial fibrillation. Um, they frequently have atrial arrhythmias not only because of WPW, but also because as we've talked about before, when the right atrium gets big and dilated and, and uh, the, it electrically remodels and it predisposes to atrial arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation as well as atrial flutter. In approximately 40% of cases, uh, Epstein's anomaly is associated with left heart disease, most commonly mitral valve prolapse or left ventricular non-compaction. And it, the left ventricular non-compaction is specifically associated with myosin heavy chain gene mutations, which can be um, connected with uh, Epstein's anomaly. And Epstein's anomaly is remarkably common in patients who have le uh, LTGA, or transposition, the congenitally corrected transposition of the great vessels. The reasons for this I don't know. Whatever genetic abnormality predisposes patients to getting LTGA must just kind of go along with it. Physiologically, uh, Epstein's patients develop symptoms of right-sided congestive heart failure predominantly due to severe tricuspid valve regurgitation, but also at least in part due to having a very small right ventricle, which frequently is dysfunctional. And in the setting of atrial septal defects, they may become cyanotic. So what do we do in the setting of Epstein's anomaly? And the answer is I really don't know. And for those of you who heard my lecture last year, I said that my disclosure was I hate Epstein's anomaly. I don't get to make as many jokes this year because I have to talk about Epstein's anomaly and pulmonary valve and uh, stenosis in the same lecture. So I have to get through it. But I still hate Epstein's anomaly. And the reason is, is that I don't know that doing the repair actually makes patients feel better. It kind of makes me feel better because I feel like I've stopped progress of, of a pathologic process. But um, as a result of the fact that the atrialized portion of the ventricular myocardium is basically dysfunctional, even once it's reintegrated into the ventricle, it just doesn't help that much with the ventricle's oomph. What you mainly are doing the repair for is to reduce tricuspid valve insufficiency. Now, that being said, probably repair is better than replacement. And with the cone-style repair, 
there is some evidence, this is from the Mayo Clinic, that there's an improvement in NYHA functional class post-repair. The improvements in actual, you know, uh, reproducible exercise tolerance in terms of VO2 max may or may not be actually present. It's, it's kind of questionable. The improvements in index forward flow are probably um, real. So questionable objective benefit in terms of improvement in cardiac outputs. People do feel a little bit better. I don't know exactly the reason why. But what you probably definitely do is prevent progression um, to, uh, to frank right heart failure. If you're unable to repair the tricuspid valve, you can replace it. And in that setting, it's better to put in a bioprosthetic valve. There's also data from the Mayo Clinic where they actually looked at patients in whom they placed either a bioprosthetic valve or a mechanical valve. And they found that the durability of the bioprosthetic and mechanical valve in terms of needing reoperation was fairly comparable, but that those with a mechanical ha valve had a, fi a far higher rate of, um, of complications. And this isn't survival like they died. This is event-free survival. So they were much more likely to have bleeding, obviously, because they were required to take Coumadin if they had a mechanical valve, valve dysfunction, and valve thrombosis. So if, they need, if a patient with Epstein's anomaly does require valve replacement, Bioprosthetic valve is the way to go. Shifting gears then on my Ferrari, which I love the gated transmission. It just looks so cool. Um, speaking about, I don't have a Ferrari. I'm just kidding. I have a Honda. <laughs> it's red, though. <laughs> pulmonary stenosis, um, kind of self-explanatory. It means that the pulmonary valve is narrowed. Um, uh, etiologically, or rather epidemiologically, about 7% of all congenital heart disease. Um, it's a, actually a relatively common uh, congenital lesion. It is commonly associated with other lesions, not only tetralogy of Fallot, but transposition, tricuspid atresia. I mean, almost everything has pulmonary stenosis commonly associated with it. Uh, most commonly sporadic, but it can be genetic or familial. There's a slight female predominance. And I mean, I guess it's no surprise what pulmonary stenosis is, is. It's stenosis of the pulmonary valve right here. But what does that look like pathologically? Like, if you were looking at the valve, what does it look like? So normally these valves, when they close, they look more or less like a Mercedes-Benz sign. And those separations between the leaflets, which make up the Mercedes-Benz sign, are called commissures. Normally those commissures separate all the way. In the setting of congenital pulmonic stenosis, or congenital aortic stenosis for that matter, the commissures don't unfuse all the way. They have some partial fusion. And some, some one of the commissures may be fused more than the next. And usually, it's so the valve leaflets won't separate from each other, and the valve therefore won't open all the way during systole. For that reason, the treatment of choice is balloon valvuloplasty, where you put a balloon up and across the valve. Usually, the incompletely um, delaminated commissures are points of weakness in the valve. And so if you just blow up a balloon, which is indiscriminate in the valve, the valve will fracture along the planes, kind of more or less where the commissure should be. And, they, and it doesn't result in just severe torrential valve destruction in PI, pulmonary insufficiency. Not always true. But that's the thought process anyway. So, in pulmonary stenosis, what types of things can happen? You can have main PA or LPA enlargement. This is thought to be post-stenotic dilatation due to some high-velocity jet striking the pulmonary arterial wall because of the orientation of the pulmonary valve. It seems to go out to the left more, so you get more LPA than RPA enlargement. The right ventricle, in reaction to the increased load, the increased afterload, pushing the blood across that narrowed orifice will become hypertrophied and eventually can get, um, it can fail. Um, and then after, uh, after repair, either balloon valvuloplasty or surgical valvuloplasty, patients are typically left with at least some degree of pulmonary valve insufficiency. And pulmonary valve insufficiency, if moderate to severe, over the course of years can lead to right ventricular chamber enlargement, kind of like we were talking about with the trilogy of Fallot. Oops. Um, by both whether pulmonary stenosis or severe pulmonary valve regurgitation, eventually you can develop right ventricular failure. Obviously, the mechanism of that failure is different in the setting of pulmonary stenosis. It's because the right ventricle, with that very high afterload over the course of years, will fail. 
in the setting of pulmonary valve uh, insufficiency, the right ventricle, as a result of progressive dilatation and the advent of tricuspid valve regurgitation will eventually fail. This manifests itself typically as peripheral edema, not usually pulmonary edema. Obviously, it hasn't gotten to the lungs yet, and exercise intolerance. What can we do about it? Well, there is some, uh, so as I've already mentioned, initially the best repair is valvuloplasty. That's recommended across the board. If, however, somebody is either not a candidate for valvuloplasty, perhaps they have, instead of conventional pulmonary valve stenosis, they have a dysplastic pulmonary valve where the leaflets are abnormal and the annulus is small, in which setting pulmonary valvuloplasty does not work, you can do pulmonary valve replacement. Pulmonary valve replacement can be surgical or it can be percutaneous depending on the size of the annulus. We'll talk about percutaneous first because the majority of the patients that we see as adults have had pulmonary stenosis as a child, have had either a surgical or a balloon valvuloplasty, and when we see them, the problem is pulmonary valve insufficiency. And in that setting, percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement is a possibility. You can use, again, no company affiliation, either an Edwards product, which would be the sapien valve that's designed for aortic valve replacement, but has been found to be efficacious and is FDA approved for use as a percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement, or the Melody valve, which is a Medtronic product and um, is specifically designed for use. Um, actually, it's supposed to be used only in conduits, but people are using it in native right ventricular outflow tracts as well. This is data actually from, um, I think this is from Mayo Clinic as well, um, where they looked at um, the durability of percutaneous valves as compared to bi bioprosthetic pulmonary valves. And I, if you look at the top here, it just shows overall uh, percutaneous valve durability. Here you've compared the durability of the bioprosthetic, or the, uh, bioprosthetic surgically placed valve in red to the percutaneous valve in black, and you can see they're actually fairly comparable, at least out to six to seven years. It looks like they may be starting to separate, but um, again, because these valves are relatively new, we don't have super long-term follow-up on this. And then this last graph shows that in the, uh, there seems to be a bit of a learning curve in implanting these valves, either that or that the technology may have gotten slightly better, that, which has been the case with the sapient valve, although I don't know that the I don't know that a melody valve has gone through new iterations, but it shows that it seems that the outcomes at least up to two years may be better in the current era than they were in the earliest era when the valves were first being implanted. And that may be just operator technique improves as they get, a, they get accustomed to doing the procedure. How about if you need to have a surgical valve placed, if for whatever reason you're not a candidate for a percutaneous valve? Um, this, uh, on the t starting at the top upper left-hand corner, this, tells, this shows you what I've mentioned before, that you have about a half-life of 10 years when you have a tissue valve placed in the pulmonary position. But unlike in the tricuspid valve position, it seems like mechanical valves may actually work with increased durability in the pulmonary valve position. And this is something I actually wanted to talk to Dr. McGillivray about because I don't think anybody puts mechanical valves in the pulmonary position, but at least these are a couple of... Um, Man, uh, uh, articles that I found when I was doing the research for this, for this lecture, and I, it shows that the durability of a mechanical pulmonary valve replacement is actually superior to that of a tissue pulmonary valve replacement. You do need to be on anticoagulation, but the complication rate and the need for valve replacement, unlike in the tricuspid position, appears to be actually quite, quite favorable in the pulmonary position. So I, I'd, I'd want to actually ask Dr. McGillivray about that a little bit more. Maybe, maybe he could give some insight into that. Um, obviously, um, there is a certain risk of, of bleeding that goes along with a mechanical pulmonary valve um, in, this, in this bottom graph here. So, that's my last slide, but we'll just to over, go over the indications for either tricuspid valve surgery in the setting of Epstein's anomaly or pulmonary valve surgery in the set of pulmonary stenosis. For Epstein's anomaly, if you have evidence of exercise intolerance, or progressive right ventricular contractile dysfunction, that's a class 1A indication for tricuspid valve replacement in Epstein's anomaly. If you have evidence of progressive right ventricular dilatation, evidence of right to left shunting either in the form of cyanosis or a paradoxical embolism, or if you have the onset of atrial arrhythmias, those are 2A indications for tricuspid valve surgery in Epstein's anomaly. For pulmonary valve uh, disease, if you have pulmonary stenosis, 
that is moderate or severe in degree, degree and you have symptoms, that's an indication for valvuloplasty if possible, if not possible, valve replacement. For pulmonary valve insufficiency, if you ha it's similar to what we talked about with tetralogy flow. If you have symptoms with pulmonary valve insufficiency that's at least moderate or severe, not attributable to any other identifiable cardiovascular cause or any other cause, then it's an indication for pulmonary valve replacement or in the setting of progressive right ventricular systolic dysfunction or enlargement. That, that would be a 2B indication, for, or 2A indication for replacement. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you.